a wonderful day it has been. I want to also mention we have a special video. We're going to go ahead and have that for next week. I want to make sure that everything's working properly. I, uh, if it's on YouTube, our Wi-Fi isn't the best in the world, so we want to just make sure that we have a hotspot for it or whatever we need. Go through it and make sure it's ready to go. But a quick uh, clip from a wonderful, wonderful meeting that we had with our young adults and our and our youth uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we want to uh, just uh, praise the Lord for what uh, He did during that time and continue to pray for them. And you're not going to forget about them because we're going to remind you next week uh, with a wonderful uh, just. Uh, reminder with the video next week. Amen? Let's do this. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. How many are excited about the Word of God? Amen. You know, I'll tell you, I've heard people say this. Uh, it never happened to me until probably the last few years uh, in an independent Baptist church, but I can remember other churches that would say things like this. Well, you know, we got to just carrying on and doing this and that and singing, and, and we never even got around to preaching. And they felt good about that. Can I tell you something? If we call for a preaching service, there's going to be preaching, amen? amen. Uh, we, uh, we're all about uh, uh, testimonies, and we're all about prayer, and we're, and we're the first ones to say, let's let the Holy Spirit move. But I believe when you call a preaching meeting, and that's what we do on Sunday morning, uh, for Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, we call those preaching meetings. They're a time to come together and to get into the Word of God. I don't want to go to a church where the Word of God is not preeminent. Amen? And, uh, and it can even happen in some circles where you wouldn't necessarily think it would happen. But I'll just tell you this. I can, I can, I, I can also speak, I think, for Pastor Ashley. We'll make sure a preaching goes on around here. Amen? Amen? And so with that said, I'm excited. This is my favorite part of the whole day. Getting into the Word of God. Notice with me, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 25. And there, were, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. Or, what king? Going to make war against another king, sitteth, death, sitteth not down first, and counteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand, or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth. Uh, conditions of peace uh, to uh, so likewise whosoever uh, be of you that forsaketh not all that he had he cannot be my disciple and then notice verse 34 salt is good but if the salt hath lost its savor wherewith shall it be seasoned it is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him <coughs> hear. Father, we do thank you for this morning already. My heart is full as, as we have had opportunity uh, to sing praises to you, to, to by the testimony of the walk down the center aisle, we see the commitment uh, to uh, want to grow in our 
uh, walk in relationship with you uh, through study of the Word of God. We know that there's no certificate, there's no uh, man-made institution that accomplishes that, but your Word accomplishes that. The Bible clearly teaches us that we're to study to show that self-approved. And Lord, we want to be, we want to be students of your word because we know that you want us to be disciples for you. This word disciple is thrown around today. It's even used on uh, signs today and it's supposed to represent the church today in some circles. And I just think we need to go back to your book, the Bible, and be reminded of what discipleship is all about and what we're all about, why discipleship matters and, and how it ought to matter to each and every one of us. We pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Please notice with me Luke chapter 14, verse 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and cometh after me cannot be my disciple. That's pretty poignant language, if you ask me. I think the most emphatic language that you'll find regarding discipleship is found right here, no doubt about it. So why, in fact, would there be churches that, that, that say on their sign, disciples of Christ, yet they no longer hold to the Bible? Or I don't even know if they ever did, but I know for a fact that many of them don't hold to the, to the fact that the Bible is the word of God. That to be a disciple means to be a true follower of the Lord. Uh, just calling yourself a disciple doesn't make you a disciple any more than, uh, you know, calling yourself the president of the United States will make you the president of the United States. There's no, there, there's, there's action in discipleship. May I say this, and over the next few weeks as we talk about discipleship, especially as we prepare our hearts for various special meetings that we're going to have from the 15th through the 20th, to be a disciple is to be revived. To truly be a disciple of Christ means you have made up your mind that it's high time that nothing else get in the way of your walk in relationship with the Lord. You just simply say, I solely, completely, wholly want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's more important than my, my marriage. That's more important than my job. That's more important than my, my health. That's more important than my finances. That's more important than my prestige, my status. That's more important than anything else in the whole wide world to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if in fact that is the case, then we ought to take very seriously our role and our relationship uh, to those whom we disciple. We must be, I'm emphatic about this, we have to be a disciple-making church. That means that we will, without apology, never dial back on the business of sharing the gospel, of winning people to Jesus Christ. Amen. But we will do this. We will continue to redouble our efforts to do all that we can do to help the new believer grow in his walk and relationship with the Lord and truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You see, they're on their way to heaven when they've asked Jesus to come into their heart. That's settled. That's done. And thank the Lord for that. But there are too many Christians today who are saved, but they're not disciples. And I can tell you, it's not always their fault. It's ours. You know, this uh, just win another couple for the Lord business and not being concerned about discipleship is wrong. It's actually ungodly, and it hurts the cause of Christ. Right. Jesus would not be so emphatic about discipleship if it weren't important. And so let's do this. Let's make up our mind that as born-again believers coming together in this local assembly, in this local church, that we will be a disciple-making church. I'll tell you, there are a lot of churches that have somehow come to the conclusion that the only way you can be a disciple-making church is dial back on soul winning. Don't be so focused on soul winning. Just be focused on helping the folks grow in your church. Hey, I, I just believe you need to be bo doing both. Amen? Amen? I really do. I believe it's a mistake when a church simply is focused on soul winning and there's no real uh, emphasis or focus or teaching 
regarding discipleship. We believe that there must be, without a shadow of a doubt. As a matter of fact, we, uh, we years ago, made up our mind that we were going to do uh, uh, some things every time we had the chance to share the gospel with somebody when they made a decision for Christ, when they trusted the Lord, we would, uh, we have actually trained through uh, training, we have a ministry called Operation Go, of course, uh, 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 at least a third to half of this church has been through it, you know what I'm talking about, where just simply sharing the gospel is only but the beginning, now your job uh, is to take ownership of that individual and help that person to grow as a Christian. You make sure that he has the proper resource, a, a simple resource like Fruit That Remains, a very helpful tool, not overwhelming. We don't try to hand them 4,500 books and, and just pile him down, but we want to disciple him. We must recognize how important that is. And maybe for some of us, may I say this morning, we need to redouble our efforts to do that. After you've had the privilege of leading somebody to the Lord, sitting on the front row while the Holy Spirit is working, as this person bows their head and trusts Christ as Savior, guess what? Now the work begins. It's time to roll up your sleeve and say, I am going to become attached to this person. I'm going to do all that I can do to help this person to grow as a Christian. You say, wait a minute, they're really saved. They'll just do it all on their own. Oh, really? How about you? How about me? I don't know, why can we go all the way across the country and see that there'll be more people here on Sunday morning than there'll be here on Sunday night? Why will there be more people on Sunday night often than there is on Wednesday night? Why is that in fact the case? Are all those people not saved? No, I say many of them don't understand the important ministry and the high calling of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. They're looking at their schedule, they're looking at their time, they're looking at at everything else in life that's right. preoccupying them and being a disciple is somewhere you know well-intentioned Christians have it somewhere on the back burner somewhere but it's not a high priority and in too many cases it's because for the local church it's not a high priority and so we'll continue to do this when we lead someone to the Lord we're going to make sure that we do all we can do to help them to to grow as a Christian we're going to give them the right resources we're going to encourage them to come to church you say wait a minute if not everybody you ever lead to the Lord comes to church, they must not be saved. My friend, I'm sorry, but that's an easy out, and that's a great escape for people who don't want to share the gospel, who don't want to tell anybody anything, because nobody then can blame you for that person not growing. How about we quit worrying about ourselves and our image and worry way more about this precious soul who needs to grow as a Christian? Because the stronger he is in the Lord, the stronger we are in the Lord, and the more this local church can get done. Right. And so discipleship matters. It matters to the Lord. I, I must tell you, if we're expecting to see God continue to do big things here, and I'm saying that the Lord is not through with Maranatha Baptist <coughs> Church, we've got to make up our mind that real revival means I'm ready to truly step up and be the disciple that that the Lord wants me to be. That's what the Lord wants me to be. Notice, as we look at Scripture this morning, again, notice Jesus' terms, Jesus's terms of discipleship are clear and are uncompromising. You know, I, I'm sorry, but I, I watch some of these films, and some of us get so excited when a Christian movie comes out, and we're, you know, you know, we're jumping up and down and thrilled to death. You know, there's about that much Christianity in most of these Christian movies. I'm just going to tell you right now. That's just the truth. And I'll tell you what you don't see in the world today, and that is a, a, a driving home, a clear message that the Lord is un uncompromising when it comes to you being a follower of Him. He's not thrilled with mediocre Christianity. He is in no way impressed with half-hearted attendance and, and lackadaisical, uh, uh, tepid attitudes towards the kingdom of God and serving him. He's truly not. 
And you may think, well, you know, Jesus is love and everything is great and wonderful. And, and, you know, he's just so glad that, you know, I happen to show up every once in a while. He wants, are you ready? Are you ready? He wants more from you than that. He wants, are you ready? He wants all of you. And how amazing is it? Uh, you can figure out the fractions because it doesn't work here on this planet. When you give him all of you, he will then empower you to be all that you can be in every other part of your life. Right, right. You want to be the right kind of husband? Give your heart to the Lord. Amen. You want to be the right kind of a, a, of a family who's drawing closer together? When this family draws closer to the Lord, they'll draw closer to one another. Right. When you decide that Jesus Christ is first, it will make all the difference. I remember hearing about someone who took on a, who took uh, the, the leadership of a Bible college, and he said, I promise you, and I commit to giving you second place, all of the second part of my heart to serving in this, in this capacity, because first place belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen. Does first place belong to Jesus Christ today for you? Hmm. Is there room in your heart for that area of your life to, to see growth? I would say for all of us, we would, if we were honest this morning, we'd have to say, I need to get back to where I used to be. I need to be proudly in a godly way. I'm not sure we're allowed to use the word pride in, in, in following the Lord, but I can tell you, I want to be the disciple that the Lord wants me to be. Notice, loyalty to the Lord must come before all other loyalties. How do, you, how, do, how do you receive that? I mean, that seems easy enough to say, doesn't it? I mean, it really does. Did you know that most people choose what church they're going to by how convenient it is uh, to get to that church? How convenient it might be, how close it might be to where they live, how convenient it is to get in and out of the place, especially out. <laughs> and then they consider important, real important issues like, um, are the pews comfortable? Are, are they, you know, pretty quick about getting everything done in and out on time? If we were to consider our relationship as husband and wife the same way, you know what kind of a marriage we would have. Mm. I just want a convenient marriage. I just want one that's real easy. You know, a, I'm talking about a marriage that is, you know, a turnkey operation. One that I don't have to really do anything. It just all kind of falls into place. You see, because I have on my finger a ring, and this says that I'm married, and so therefore it ought to all just go, and it ought to all just flow. That doesn't work in the marriage, and it sure won't work in your relationship with the Lord. I can tell you for a fact that those of us who have misplaced loyalties, and we keep on fooling ourselves and talking ourselves into believing that that in fact is not the case, we are... We are just lying to ourselves. A misplaced loyalty would be, yeah, I'm glad that the church is doing that, but I haven't paid much attention to the youth lately. I don't even know any of those kids, and I don't really pray for them. I'm sure glad that we've got a great youth group, and that's what I've been hearing anyway. That's misplaced loyalty. You say, why? Because you're loyal to maybe a television program, or a particular outing, or a particular, uh, you know, sporting event, or whatever else you might be loyal to, but you don't even know uh, the young people in your own church. And young people, the same thing goes for you. You know, it's interesting how we'll know certain, you know, like those with family know the kids of those who have family. And then there are people like me who can't even remember the names of his own children, and he only has two. So imagine what happened when I got eight grandkids. I mean, it's just, it becomes confusing. You know, let me speak as a man for just a moment. 
I became very impressed with myself when I could actually name all of my grandkids, and I won't do it right now. I just won't. <laughs> because that says that they matter. And if, and if we're going to have the loyalty that we're supposed to have, we're going to care about one another. We are going to know uh, how to pray for one another. We're going to be encouraging one another. We're going to matter to one another. That demonstrates our love relationship with the Lord. Loyalty to the Lord must come before one's own desires. Ouch. Again, very easy to say, and it's very easy to uh, tell people that that, in fact, is what's, you know, what's happening in your life. May I ask you a question? What does it really mean? I mean, what desire could I possibly have that, that would even you know, begin to come before my relationship with the Lord? Well, some of what we've already talked about, right? Some of what we already know takes place in our hearts all too often. I remember one church where, I'll tell you what, just about the time the folks at that church thought it was time to be done preaching, you would start hearing alarms go off on people's watches. That was back when we wore watches before we had as many cell phones. And, uh, you know, I'm so glad I'm hard of hearing. Amen. And I'm so glad that, that clock is too far away for me to see. Amen. <laughs> In Sunday school this morning, I mentioned there was no clock on the on the wall, and we heard a oh my. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how we can go to a ball game and we can sit there for three and a half hours and jump up and down and uh, eat good food like hot dogs and 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 all this other kind of stuff and and and. And be fanatical. That's what the you know fan is short for fanatical, right? Yet we'll come to church and we'll think, well, I'm not going to overdo it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to. I see some people actually shed a tear or or get down on their knees and pray. I mean, that, that's a little over the top for me. I'm a little more dignified than that. But then you'll go out into a football field and and take your shirt off and paint numbers on your chest. I don't get that. <laughs> I gotta tell you something. Our flesh will fight us to the bitter end all the time. And uh, even if it's not overt, over the top sin that you're involved in, it's it's going to be issues of, of fatigue. I mean, some folks are just way too tired to even go to church on Sunday. Uh, you know, one of the greatest challenges of ministry Especially when it comes to, for example, bus ministry is I've got kids who have, well, so-called parents or guardians that let them run around till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And so when we pick them up, they're zombies. And they look like it and they walk like it and they kind of are. That's if you can get them. You know, our, our largest group comes on a Wednesday night because it takes all day to wake a kid up. It's hard to get children in church on Sunday morning for Sunday school now. Right. And you know what? Hey, look. Some of you church families, you know you're in the same boat. You're not getting here because you don't want to be here. You're not getting here simply because there's too much going on in your life on Saturday for you to get anything done for the Lord on Sunday. You say, get anything done? I'm supposed to just show up for church. Coming to church is an act of worship. It's an act of work. It's an act of ministry. It's, a, it's an opportunity to say, Lord, speak to me. I want to receive what you have for me. You know, we need to be excited. And you're not going to be excited if you're tired, if you're wore out, if you're beat down. Right. Now, we also know that emotionally speaking, we can be struggling. And... and it's no matter what this preacher says, he can turn blue trying to convince me that, that our priorities need to be changed. But in our heart of hearts, they just aren't. Some of us are sitting here right now and thinking about some issues in their life and some things that they need to, to accomplish this week. And some are thinking, I need to get this done and that done. And I need to, uh, you know, continue to worry about this and be preoccupied with that. 
You know, one of these days I might even join Bible Institute. But not now. You know, it might even be a consideration that I go out door knocking. But not now. Not now. You see, this is putting your desires. You say, well, these are hardships, difficulties, challenges. You know what? You have allowed for whatever these things to be, whether they be uh, entertainment and personal, uh, you know, just, you know, taking, you know, entertaining yourself or issues, uh, your focus is on things other than the Lord. Because if, in fact, our focus was on the Lord in the first place, guess what would happen? You know what will happen. These other things will fall into place. God is on the throne. He's in control. He'll take care of these, these issues no matter what. Right. So take no thought for tomorrow. Recognize that your God loves you more than anybody in this room. Amen. Your God loves you more than anybody in the whole wide world. Your God loves you more than anyone in the whole universe. And he's more mindful of your need than anyone else is. And he's a jealous God, and he deservingly must receive your highest priority, your attention. I, you know what? Are you ready? I challenge you to try that out. I challenge you to make up your mind and say, no more. No more am I going to let uh, other loyalties, other desires come before my Lord. I'm going to be more focused. I'm asking the Lord to help me now to be more compassionate, to be more absolutely uh, resolved to, to focus on the Lord and allow the Lord to have his way with me. Amen. You know, Jesus doesn't seek false disciples. Now, I think sometimes when you hear preachers preach on this, they get off on an issue that I think is, is not, how should I put this? Well, first of all, I think they're wrong. I think anytime you want to question every time somebody gets saved, whether or not they're saved or not, uh, whether or not they meet your approval, you're, uh, well, you're wasting a whole lot of energy and breathing a whole lot of air. Why don't you quit doing it? Amen? Because you need to be focused more on your walk and relationship with the Lord and helping to disciple someone who has made a decision for the Lord. But you know, the truth is, there are going to be those who say yes to the Lord. <clears throat> Let me just say there are two categories. There are those who say yes to the Lord. They've asked Christ to come into their heart. And they never really grow. They are baby Christians until the Lord takes them to heaven. I mean, how many believe that that, in fact, can be the case? Absolutely. We know that that can be the case. Right. Have we seen people come along who... Who, who they get saved and they're hungry and they're growing and, uh, and, and weeks turn into months and before you know it, uh, God is using them because they're, 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 they're in the word of God and they're, and they're just absorbing the scriptures. They're demonstrating what a, what a real disciple is all about. But then there's also the group out there that um, I believe, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, when I say this, I do not go walking around and pointing fingers at people and saying, well, that guy's probably not saved, or that gal over there probably didn't really mean it when she trusted the Lord. You know, I, I have found over, over the last 30 years that there's not a whole lot of fruit in that. I think I'm going to leave that part in the Lord's hands, and I'm going to do my best to help them and to disciple them. But as we examine our own heart, I think it's a fair question to ask. When you said that you became a Christian, did you want it? Did you recognize your need for the Savior? Did you ask Jesus to come to your heart? You say, of course, that's exactly what I did. You know, if we simply, you know, wanted to get our wife off of our back or, or get in with a certain group or, or just uh, feel better about ourselves and we didn't uh, and, and we knew in our heart that we weren't really wanting this, then I think it's fair to say uh, you can't be a disciple. You're truly a false disciple because you're not saved. And, and when I say that, I say that to, to the one who, whom the Holy Spirit is speaking to. 
And it's important that we do say that. It's important that we understand that. And yes, there should be fruit in your life. There should be a, 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 a change in your life. Right. But if you think that every single person grows the same way, every single person is exactly a cookie cutter cut out of the other person, I just gotta tell you something. Are you ready for some really good English? That ain't true. It's just not. And I have seen people, I, I can tell you over the years of, uh, of uh, folks who have gotten saved and they never really quite grew until they came to a place where they understood that they needed to get baptized and then they started serving. I saw others who got baptized and then I never saw them again. One, person, one preacher said the best way to get somebody out of your church is get them baptized. You say, what does that mean? That means that the, they're done. They're out of here. Let's finish this morning by looking at these two very small parables. And uh, let's ask the Lord to help us to see exactly what the Lord is trying to say to us. Notice thirdly this morning, two parables emphasize the importance of carefully weighing the issues. And that's exactly, and we can see how this applies to a whole lot of areas of our life, but let's not forget, the Lord's been talking about discipleship all the way up until he shares these parables. So notice again, uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Well, what's that all about? I'll tell you what it's about. When you decide it's time to step up and truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will count the cost right. and you will finish the course. We're not talking about your salvation. We're not talking about you losing your salvation. We're talking about you staying in it for the long haul. You'll say, I am, I am realizing that it does, it does cost to make up my mind to be here when the doors are open. It does cost to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. It will cost for me to step up and serve where the Lord would have me to serve. It's not easy. Right. When, we, when we say it's easy, we lie. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Hey, I'll tell you what, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. When you ask Jesus into your heart, he paid it all. You're saved, you're on your way to heaven. But to serve him, to walk with him, to be a disciple, means that you count the cost. You don't start building a building with no anticipation of finishing the building and then have everybody else look at you and say, what a goofball over there with that half-built building. That's why this is a great building program <laughs> scripture. But it also speaks to every other area of our life. Anytime we step out and we start to do something, and we haven't truly considered all that's involved in getting it done, we hurt the cause of Christ. Forget about embarrassing ourselves. We hurt the cause of Christ when people see us, you know, firing hot potatoes for a week or two, and then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. how many preachers would say, I'm always careful. I'm always very, very careful when I see somebody getting fired up and excited Especially if I've seen that happen before, and it only lasts for a short little while, and then before you know it, they're not even around. Right. We begin to start thinking, we can, you know what, we, we can depend on this person. We can count on this person. We know this person's going to be there. And you know what, we're going to begin to give this person more responsibility, and then boom, they're gone. Don't start building a house without counting the cost. No doubt about it. And then secondly, notice verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. That makes sense, doesn't it? Let me think. 
We're gonna fight. I've got 10,000 and you've got 20,000. I'm thinking we should negotiate. I'm thinking we should have a peace treaty. That's what I'm thinking. You know, the Lord simply says that the conditions of discipleship are always going to be a challenge. Right. If you, if you buy into the lie of the contemporary culture that says easy Christianity is the way to go, then you will never enjoy what the Lord has for you when it comes to truly being sold out and committed to him. Right. I think it's time. It's high time. It's, it's, it's past time for some of us to quit playing games, to quit just going through the motions, to quit just leading this meager, lackadaisical, watered-down, tepid Christian life. Right. It, it's described in the book of Revelation. I would rather you be hot or cold. At least I know what you are. But if you're lukewarm, if you're simply just tepid, you make me want to throw up. Can I ask you a question? Are you satisfied? Is this exactly where you want to be? I say no. I think I can speak for each and every one of us, no matter what station of life you're in, no, longer how, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how you might be serving, if you don't want to draw closer to be used in a greater way, that ought to be a red flag today, right now, for you. There's no doubt about that. I've not met a, I've not met a pastor yet who is satisfied with uh, what he uh is accomplishing for the Lord. Now, again, we're not talking about getting focused on ourselves. We're talking about reestablishing the proper focus on Him. Because when, when this relationship is what it needs to be, it will always improve this relationship. Amen? Amen. I say today would be a good day to step up and say, I'm no longer going to stay this way. And I don't want to be here. And here's what I want to do. You want to make sure that you spend some time in prayer today. We're going to have an invitation. Come forward. Spend some time with the Lord. And walk out of this place making sure that you get off of the table back there. This little questionnaire. Preparation for personal revival. How many say that's a good plan? Preparation for personal revival. What a wonderful plan. Amen. Oh, yeah, I'll say it. But, man, in my heart, I'm thinking, oh, my. Oh, let me just tell you something. If you'll let God get a hold of your heart, just take this personal inventory. <clears throat> let the Lord have his way with you and watch what the Lord will do. Men, be spiritual leaders in your home. Make this a part of your devotion. And make this a part of your, uh, your teaching time with your family. Amen? Make this a high priority. You say, well, I got better materials than that. Well, I'll tell you what. The problem is we're not doing anything about most of this. So go ahead and grab this and make it part of whatever else you're doing. But make up your mind that you're going to do all that you can do to prepare for personal revival. Revival always begins with me. It always does. It begins in prayer. It begins with me. And it also begins with you. This is not for your wife. This is not for your husband. This is not for your children. I sure wish that Uncle Fred was here to hear this message. This is for you. This is for me. I want God to do something bigger in my life. I've been saved for a gazillion years. I trusted Christ in 1968. Some of you, do you realize that that was when we landed on the moon? Some of you said, we, we landed on the moon? <laughs> and I don't know how many days my Lord has left for me but I want to be closer to him Man. than I've ever been Man. I consider the greatest accomplishment of a Christian is his walk in relationship with the Lord 
Let's all stand.